the Jewish people would say that they did not keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath kept them. I really feel that in my life, that the Sabbath has kept me, that I'm still alive because of the Sabbath. I'm still actively involved in ministry because of the Sabbath. Be curious about your resistance. Why am I resisting? What am I resisting? Why is this so hard? And just see what happens. And God could, you know, really work, you know, in your willingness to be with that question, because I believe that the Sabbath will save our lives. Ruth Haley Barton. Here at ECFA, we have been quoting from her wise writings for years. Author of Sacred Rhythms, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, and Embracing Rhythms of Work and Rest, to name a few. She is a founding president and CEO of the Transforming Center. The word Sabbath comes up a lot in this conversation. We encourage you to consider what that word means to you. Consider how you react to it. Sabbath. Did you just feel peace and hope? Or pressure and anxiety? Stick around. God made it for us. Like Ruth said. Because I believe that the Sabbath will save our lives. Ruth, thank you so much for being on the ECFA podcast today. How are you? Oh, I'm well, and I'm just really excited to be here and talk to you in this way. Yes, yeah, same here. Uh, you know, as I've shared with you before, of course, just appreciate you so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have blessed me personally and my leadership, and I know so many at ECFA. Uh, so we want to say thank you for that and excited for today's conversation about healthy mm-hmm. leadership. I know that yeah. is a topic that is near and dear to both of our hearts, right? Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to say to you, thank you for your work. We are proud members of ECFA here yes. in the Transforming Center. <laughs> and so we display our certificate with pride. And we are just so grateful for the resources that you offer not-for-profit organizations. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, proud to have Transforming Center apart. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you mentioned the ECFA standards. And Ruth, I think that's a great mm-hmm. way just even launching in uh, to this yeah. conversation today mm-hmm. and thinking about healthy leadership and Maybe folks don't always make the connection, but we think about that a lot here at ECFA and just how important healthy leadership is to what we say our mission at ECFA Mm -hmm. is, which is enhancing trust, the importance of healthy Mm -hmm. leadership and enhancing trust, and also Mm -hmm. just having this environment, uh, a healthy culture and environment where the rest of the ECFA standards can flourish. So Mm -hmm. healthy leadership. Yeah, tell us, maybe just give us some thoughts on, you know, as you think about organizations, when there is healthy leadership, how does the organization Mm -hmm. look differently? Yeah. I think one really good place to start is the whole idea of systems theory, um, which I really believe in. And um, systems theory has to do with the fact that when human beings get together, they become a system and that everything that goes on in the system then affects other members of the system, like a spider web almost, where you move one part of the spider web and the whole thing vibrates. Um, It's very much like that. And so um, in, in a system where there is health within the leadership, then um, there still needs to be intentionality, but the health of the, the leader and the leaders will actually sort of find its way throughout uh, the, all the edges of the organization. The converse is also true, and that's a little bit more sobering, and that is that whatever is unhealthy and dysfunctional and not working at the leadership center um, will also find its way out to the edges of the organization. And so um, leadership, you know, really... Uh, in, in many ways is one of the most important aspects of a healthy organization because health or unhealth is going to come from that person and also from the board um, and the leadership group itself and then the staff also. So these leadership groupings are just really, really significant for the health of the whole organization because it just emanates out. It radiates out. Whatever is working emanates and radiates. Whatever's not working emanates and radiates, which of course is very sobering, you know, for leaders to realize that the quality of their presence and their leadership is so impactful. Yes, quite a responsibility uh, Mm. that we have, don't we? So in your opinion, uh, so we often hear it said, the tone is set at the top. That's not an overstatement, right? Yeah. And it's so interesting because I tend to not use the top down language. I tend to use the center out language. So, you know, the transforming center, it's actually a triple entendre, (laughs) Um, beginning with the life of the leader, you know, that whatever is there and present in the center will find its way out. Um, And, you know, then there's the leadership group itself and whatever is true. 
there will find its way out. And so I, I like to talk a little bit more about the center versus the top down way. So, um, but either way you look at it, it makes leadership very, very important. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, you have to forgive mm -hmm. me for that accounting reference because mm -hmm. that's more kind of like what they say mm -hmm. in accounting world is the tone yeah. is set at the top. But I really mm -hmm. like your language about that is mm -hmm. it's really center out and we yeah. just can't separate. Yeah, the importance no. of the health of the leader in the organization. Mm -hmm. It's really true. So it's really true. No, good. And I know you have uh, written a lot about, you've spoken a lot about uh, this topic and one of the latest uh, just great resources from you, Ruth, talks about the importance of rest, even when it comes to healthy leadership. And mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk just a little bit. How do you see rest being such an important part of God's design, mm -hmm. even for healthy leadership, not just Christians, but especially in leadership? Yeah. Well, first of all, we have to understand that we are human beings who have limits. And so um, if we don't acknowledge that reality and work with it and honor it, then we will get to some very dangerous places. Um, in this newest book, Embracing Rhythms of Work and Rest, it was really important to me that we talk uh, more about the rhythm than just just the thing of rest, because the beauty is in the rhythm, the goodness is in the rhythm between work and rest and rest and work. And in fact, there's such a symbiotic relationship between work and rest that rest in many ways gives meaning to our work. Because, you know, when we rest, we can step back from our work. We can see how we're partnering with God in that work. We can savor the fruits of our work. We can become re-energized for our work. Um, and so it definitely contributes to our work. And then our work actually gives meaning to our rest. Because without work, our rest would actually become laziness or unproductivity or purposelessness, um, things like that. And so um, rest wouldn't be anything if we didn't yeah. also have work. So uh, it's the rhythm between the two that makes it good. We're not elevating one over the other. I just want to be really clear about that as we begin, that our work is good. And that's why I insisted that the word work be in the title yes. so that nobody thinks that rest is better than work. It's the rhythm between the two that's really beautiful and good and fruitful. Um, but God created us as human beings that have limits, and we have limits. And God knows how God created us and knows that we can get out beyond our limits. And we are the creatures. We are not the creator. Um, and God didn't need rest, but we as human beings do need rest. And without a sane rhythm of work and rest, and that's how I like to talk about it, there's every possibility that we can get out beyond our limits and get out to some really destructive places, places where we're no longer making good decisions, places where uh, we're just mentally and spiritually tired. And so uh, we don't have the stamina for discernment. We don't have the stamina to be present to really difficult situations and topics and subjects that require discernment. Um, I think a lot of times um, moral failures actually come out of exhaustion, mm -hmm. where a pastor has been putting out for so long, or, or a ministry leader has been putting out for so long, that they get to this point where they're so tired that, um, you know, they no longer make good moral decisions, or they even think that there's a sense of entitlement, that I've been working so hard for Jesus that I deserve this thing that may or may not be good. Or there's escapist behaviors and numbing behaviors that we begin to engage because we don't have the stamina to do the life-giving thing. Um, so, or, and then, you know, of course, one of the most obvious is that we can just give up, that at some <laughs> sure. point a leader can become so exhausted that they say, I can't do this anymore, I'm out, you know. Um, and that's a travesty. That's a tragedy if sane rhythms of work and rest would have kept them in the game. And because they didn't know how and we didn't know how to help, they just kept working at a level that caused them to need to ditch the whole thing. That's a huge loss to the ministry itself and also to the kingdom of God. So there are really dangerous results that come from not living within these sane rhythms of work and rest. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much to unpack in what you just mm -hmm. said. But yeah, I was even thinking through as Ruth, yeah, you were talking about this level of exhaustion can just lead mm -hmm. to poor behaviors and so many other things mm -hmm. and even moral failures and some of the most tragic you know, of these situations in all of your work with leaders, mm -hmm. how many would you say, Ruth, are even aware of just how dangerously close they are to that brink of, you know, a moral failure or making some sort mm -hmm. of decision that's catastrophic? I mean, what is mm -hmm. the level of awareness, do you think, that even many leaders have when it comes to the lack of rest? 
You know, I wish I, I, I wish I knew. I mean, we know about the Great Resignation right now. We know that more pastors than ever, maybe even 50 percent, um, and I would include in that Christian ministry leaders who have had to endure the last couple of years and lead and make decisions. Um, that I mean, the statistics we're hearing it could be as much as 50 percent of mm. people who are. Um, wondering if they can survive ministry and are thinking maybe even actively about leaving ministry. Um, What I do know is that when people come to us, this is where we start. When people come to us in the Transforming Center, we start with the invitation to retreat and the invitation to rest in God and the opportunity to diagnose a little bit whether or not they're dangerously tired. So we actually talk about tiredness as a continuum that there is refreshed and replenished where you really are doing ministry out of uh, a replenished self and soul, a soul that's connected with God. Then there's good tired, which we all move in and out of. Um, when we give our all to something, a new initiative or something like that, or, you know, there are seasons that can be really intense, but, um, we know how to come back into our practices that bring us back to a place of rest and replenishment. And then we don't emerge again until we've been refreshed and replenished that we come back out, do good ministry. And the healthy leader is living within that part of the continuum between refreshed and replenished and good tired. So it's always, always moving in that part of the continuum. Now, dangerously tired, you know, it starts to creep up and it moves over to the right. And that's when leaders are not living in sane rhythms of work and rest. They're not living in sacred rhythms. They're not caring for themselves. And over time, in a cumulative sort of way, they begin to move towards being dangerously tired. Tired, which has a set of symptoms that go with it, a set of sources that go with it. Um, and so we just start right there, helping leaders to learn how do I keep an eye on myself and make sure that I am always within this the healthy range between good, tired, and refreshed and replenished, which means that you have sacred rhythms in your life. It means you have rhythms in your life that help you come back from your tiredness, and you don't come out again until you've refreshed and replenished. And that's the way you stay in that good space. The other thing about dangerous levels of exhaustion is that it is very subtle as it accumulates over time. It's never just about one heavy season or one initiative or something like that. It's always cumulative in the way that it builds up. And it's often many, um, many things that happen along the way until one day you realize it somehow, you know, you can't get out of bed and go to work. You realize you're in depression. Um, you fly off the handle with a colleague. Um, there, there's a moral, moral failure or you, you just one day wake up and say, I need to quit. I can't do this anymore. Um, there's, there's lots of ways to, to, to diagnose that if you will. Um, and, you know, our hope is that if we help people to see this before they get all the way over to the other side and they actually know what the markers are and what the signs are, and then we, you know, begin to teach and guide into spiritual practices and sane rhythms of work and rest that, you know, hopefully we catch many of them before they get, you know, all the way to the place where something, as you said, catastrophic happens. So what I do know is that many, many, many of the people that come to us once they have some handles and some ways to express it, they are able to acknowledge uh, the dangerous levels of exhaustion. One of uh, the testimonies that we got that meant the most to me was, um, we you know we do this 27 month experience of formation for leaders, and we got to the end of it. This was transforming community 16. So this was you know you know. Um, And he said that he came in, this pastor said that he came in to the transforming community experience ready to retire and intending to retire from the ministry. And he was young. I don't even think he was 50. Um, And that was his intention coming in. But on the last night, he shared that he knew that he wasn't going to retire, but that God was telling him that he needed to retire from the way he was doing ministry. Well, that's that he good. wasn't, isn't that great? <laughs> and so his life, you know, and that he was now called to do ministry, having, you know, in, in orientation around these sacred rhythms that keep us alive. And so that's, that's kind of the thing, right? You know, we're hoping that people don't have to resign from ministry you know, to to pull their lives together, but that maybe within the context of ministry, they could discover sacred rhythms that would keep them from from having to to 
let go of ministry too soon if God's intention is still for them to be there. Yeah, no, that's good. So yeah, retiring or resigning, not from the ministry, but from the mm-hmm. way that we're doing this. And I love yes, you. exactly. You're so good with the with words, and I think that word "sane." Like you talk about mm-hmm. sane rhythms um, yeah. of rest and work, which is good. I want to actually kind of even take uh, a step or two back, if we could, mm-hmm. too, and that is just thinking, okay, if we know that rest, uh, like at a head level, we know that rest, mm-hmm. uh, this is part of God's design, is even mm-hmm. one of the Ten Commandments, like this it is something is, God commands yes. us to do. And mm-hmm. Ruth, we see all of the ways in which um, this unhealthy level of uh, this pace and work and so on can can lead to these uh, negative consequences. So why is it uh, that you think so many of us, and I'm saying us, um, us mm-hmm. as Christian leaders struggle when it comes to actually slowing down and doing, in a sense, I guess, the hard work of rest? Like, mm-hmm. why is it that we struggle so much if we know that this is a commandment and we know that we at a head level, we need this. Yeah. Well, let's, um, first of all, we could just nuance that last statement and said, it's not the rest that's hard work. It's actually ordering our lives so we can rest. And I want to just make that very clear that once we enter into rest, it's not hard work. But the hard intentional work has to do with ordering our lives and arranging our lives for the rhythms that God um, has given to us and offers to us for our good. Um, as it has to do with your question, I think there are lots of answers to that. Um, maybe we could start in, internally, um, that within our culture, many Christian leaders are doing the very same thing business leaders do, and that is on the, they're on the treadmill of achievement and performance-oriented drivenness and productivity. And in our current culture, things are moving very fast, and I, it oftentimes feels like we can't achieve all that we want to achieve if we were to establish sane rhythms of work and rest, and particularly the Sabbath rhythm of not working on the seventh day. I think for many people right now, it feels like, well, that's just impossible. Um. I can't keep up with with what my job is. I can't keep up with what others are producing. I'm also driven by my own inner desires to achieve and perform. And um, so what's inside us when it meets together with what's going on in the culture, it's a very, very potent combination right there that's almost impossible to back away from unless you're really conscious and willing to be made conscious of what's really happening and how you are in the grip of both your own internal dynamics as well as the cultural expectations. So I think there's a certain kind of grandiosity and pride that goes into it as well that, well, you know, rest is just for those weak people. It's just for retired people. It's for people that aren't in demand. It's for people that don't have a lot of um, expectations on them in their lives. It's just not for me. And there's a certain kind of grandiosity that I'm so important that the world needs me to be working yes. seven days a week, you yeah. know? Mm. <laughs> um, or the, the other kind of grandiosity is that I'm so strong, I don't need it. Right. That's that's yeah. grandiose too. And that goes along with youth. I will, if I could just be so bold mm-hmm. as to say that um, when we're young and I, you know, I, I functioned, f- you know, for the first 40 years of my life without Sabbath for that very reason. You know, I'm young, I'm strong, I've got lots of energy, I want to achieve, I want to use every day for achievement. Um, and it, And I had to sort of hit a bit of a wall in my early 40s where I was starting to get really tired of that kind of life. And then I, I needed this practice. I wish we wouldn't all have to wait until we're in our early 40s. Um, but I will say, honestly, that that's what happened for me, that I'm a pastor's kid and um, we did practice Sabbath, but it was in a very legalistic way. And so I didn't love it, wasn't drawn to it at all, and was very happy to kick it to the curb when I got out of my parents' home. And then I could, you know, it took 20 years to function all out you know, achieving and producing and trying to prove myself in the world until I couldn't do it anymore. And God began to really stir up my desire for a way of life that works. And I thank God for it. Oh, I thank God so much that he knocked me off my horse and, you know, (laughs) helped me to see that there was another and better way to do it that he knows because he created us. That's right. Yeah. If you would, Ruth, I'm so glad that you went there and speak to the younger leaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, who are listening to this podcast. Yeah. And, you know, we never want to look back and say, well, if only and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, speak to the younger leaders. And, you know, for you, what could you imagine would have been different even in your ministry trajectory and in your personal mm-hmm. life and um, your interaction with others if some of these practices maybe had been instituted earlier for you? 
Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you know, it's it's hard to know what would have been different for me. I mean, you know, for one thing, um, we didn't practice Sabbath in our home at that time. And so it wasn't something that I had the opportunity to introduce to my family because I didn't choose it for myself. And, you know, I think God has really redeemed that. In fact, um, in this new book, my daughter Charity, my oldest daughter Charity, writes about the experience of... Um, we we chose not to foist it on our kids because they were they were too old for us to do that. I wish we had started younger. She started younger, and it's been beautiful for me to watch that. Um, but she was able to describe a goodness about it. There was a difference in my presence, the quality of my presence. Um, I was not as busy. I was not as stressed. And so they loved being around me on the Sabbath because I was Sabbathing, and they knew that there was time for everything, and they recognized it. And eventually, all of them began to live it in their own adult life. So I'm grateful. The Lord has done a great work there. Um, but I would have liked to have established our family's life around the practice of Sabbath, and I missed out on that because I, I was too driven to, um, to, to put this great practice, you know, into our family's life. So sometimes I, you know, my Charity and I, I will shed a few tears about that, and she'll, you know, reassure me that, I, you know, that it was a beautiful thing that I didn't voice them and that she's really glad to have discovered it in her own way and in her own time. So I'm glad for that. But um, that's one thing that I wish I could have embedded sane rhythms of work and rest in my family's life, you know? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, what I'm so grateful for, Ruth, is that, mm-hmm. yeah, regardless of what that looked like, you know, for you years ago, is just mm-hmm. that you've taken so much of this and what you've learned. And yeah, now you're communicating uh, some of those lessons that, you know, maybe learn the hard way and so forth, but for the benefit mm-hmm. of us all and yeah, I enjoyed that portion too of just reading what mm-hmm. Charity wrote, even her own family, and as mm-hmm. someone who has a because you have young children, young family right? Myself, yeah. yeah, and I love mm-hmm. how she even redefined uh, for a young family. Um, I think what she said was something along the lines of, "I had to stop looking." Even we've used the word "rest" a lot on the podcast, but mm-hmm. I had to kind yeah. of get away from even using that word too much because with young kids, it's hard to feel like you're yeah. resting much. But That's she right. even just said the importance of it being a day of being. Uh, yeah, and, just, and presence, and being presence. present to each other in a different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was so good. And yeah, I appreciate that guidance of just Sabbath in every season of life. You know, there's mm-hmm. nothing, there's no exception in the Ten Commandments, um, you know, yeah. this has, except for, you know, when you're in such yeah. and such stage of life. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's good. Well, hey, another thing that I wanted to just kind of explore with you, and we talked about this a little bit earlier and the importance of um, a healthy leader and a healthy organization and mm-hmm. sort of how that works its way out. Um, I guess a question for you is, you know, yeah, what do you think practically leaders can do to create a Sabbath culture within their organization? So they've experienced yeah. uh, the blessing of rest of, of God's design of Sabbath in their personal life. How do they practically take steps towards creating that culture in their organization? Because mm-hmm. it's important for us all. Yeah, and I do, um, in this book, I do drive a big stake in the ground around the communal aspects of Sabbath and the fact that Sabbath was not given to individuals. It was given to the community of the children of Israel, and um, it was led by the top leader. It was led by Moses, and even when the people failed and got confused— God didn't go to anybody else. God went right back to Moses and said, this is what you're supposed to tell the people to help them do what I'm asking you to do. So number one, it needs to come from the senior leader, period. Um, I believe that with all my heart, that that is part of our leadership. And part of my hope for this book is that leaders began to really feel that this is part of their leadership to lead Sabbath communities. Um, Because what that means then is, first of all, they have their own practice going. And I do suggest that in many cases, if you can have your own practice solidified just a bit before you start to lead others, um, it gives you a certain inner authority that's really helpful. Yes. As people hear about it and they have their own discomforts and their own pushback and stuff like that, the inner authority that you have from your own practice and your own conviction will keep you calm and help you to be a a non-anxious presence in those moments, but just to continue to hold your line because you're experiencing it. And I mean, nobody can talk me out of the Sabbath now. I don't care who they are, (laughs) you know, because it's so in me. It's so significant on every single level. I'm so convinced that I just can't be moved on this topic. And so senior leaders need to be somewhat in that place of just knowing for sure that this is what we're supposed to be about and it comes from their own personal experience. 
then I think that it's really great if they can share from their own personal experience because again that's where your inner authority comes from and you can you know tell perhaps you know places of vulnerability that you've experienced when you weren't rested if 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 you came to the brink of you know anything dangerous you know you could say look I got to a pretty dangerous place without how with how exhausted I was I was dangerously tired and then you talk about how you incorporated the Sabbath practice and then also you talk about how much you want the goodness of that for others that is so winsome you know to share in that way versus this top down this is what we're going to do you know uh, kind of uh, way of communicating. So keep the, the communication about it personal and vulnerable and loving and invitational. No oughts and shoulds here, but you know, inv- what would you all think of this? Could we wonder together about Sabbath practices in our community? What would you think of that? Um, how do you feel, you know, the pace of your life is going? How is our pace together going? Can we talk about it? You know, keep it like that. Keep it conversational. And I actually include in the back of the book a conversation guide for communities. And I worked hard on it to keep it. It's not a discussion guide. It is a, a guide to help set up a conversation, but it also teaches people how to listen um, to each other really well in these intimate conversations and things like that. So the conversation guide is there to support Uh, these conversations. And then eventually, um, you know, you can start to talk about how you could incorporate. And I guess the first thing would be that hopefully you could practice Sabbath on the same day. I'm, I do have a preference for practicing Sabbath on the same day as a staff. For this reason, there's a different feeling when you're on vacation and everybody else is filling up your inbox while you're gone. And you know, you're going (laughs) to face 200, you know, emails when you get back. The dread. The dread, the dread, yes, <laughs> versus knowing everybody's practicing Sabbath. And so when I when we're all in the same place, nobody's getting ahead of me. Nobody's filling up my inbox. Sure. Um, I'm not disappointing anybody or slowing anybody down because they can't reach me. When you open up, nothing, you know, nobody emailed on the Sabbath. Oh so you're all starting out at the same place. Man, is that nice. And we have that in our own organization. And it is it is fantastic. You'd never go back, that, would you? Yeah. Never, never. And and I remember early on in my own practice when we founded the Transforming Center 20 years ago, I really did believe in Sabbath at the time and I wanted our organization to be I, I want us to be practicing Sabbath, but I had not articulated this idea of Sabbath community yet at all. It's re- actually quite new in this yeah. book. But I have learned that it's really hard for individuals to practice Sabbath when the rest of the community is not. Yeah. And so I remember early on when I was sort of experimenting and sometimes on a Sabbath, I'd get a thought in my head and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to lose that. Um, so I want to get it off my head and get it to the person that needs to receive it. Well, of course... You know, if I send an email to somebody on a Sunday, everybody sort of springs into action because, you know. It's the expectation. Yeah, Yeah. it's the expectation that as the senior leader, if I say or do or ask anything, everybody has to respond. And so when I noticed that, when I noticed people springing into action because I had sent an email just to get something off my head, I realized how selfish that was and how it did not support the practice of Sabbath for everyone. And I mean, I stopped. I stopped. Um, And now nobody in our organization sends an email on a Sunday. And um, the the expectation, the clear expectation is is that we are all taking our Sabbath. Um, And that means that Um, We can all really know that nobody's filling up our inboxes and we can truly rest and that when we wake up on Monday, the work will be there on Monday, but it's not going to be piling up on us on Sunday. Yeah, good. One one question that comes to mind too, Ruth, is I think about leaders who, you know, hearing this, excited to move forward, um, Mm -hmm. creating this culture within their organization. Uh, They might be thinking a couple of steps ahead and thinking, okay, what Mm -hmm. sort of pushback might I get and whatever. Mm -hmm. So in some of the leaders that you've coached, um, yeah, what is some of that potential pushback? Mm -hmm. Or do you just think a lot of people within the organization are going to be really excited about this? Yeah. Kind of help coach a leader through that process of two steps ahead. Well, I think that's why it's so important to start to lead out with your own personal story and your own care and concern for the people around you, because that is really winsome, for one thing. Um, Probably the staff will be maybe more excited than the board. I don't know. Um, But, you know, oftentimes what I find is that, you know, staffs are working really hard and really needing the saner rhythms. The board might have more pragmatists on it who really want to see productivity and all that sort of thing. 
So you might um, be aware of that. Um, but I think sharing with the board, honestly, is a really good way to begin as well and to be honest and let them know that you came into a very dangerous place and God's bringing you back and the Sabbath is saving your soul. And, you know, I just want to share that with you. Um, wondering how you all are feeling about your lives, you know. Um, there's all sorts of ways it can be conversational and invitational. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's pretty winsome. You may get some pushback, but when you share it that way, I think it's going to be minimal. Um, and you know, even the fact that, for instance, um, the sabbatical rhythm, it was understood both spiritually and agriculturally that land is not meant to produce, uh, just over and over and over again, that every year on this, in the seventh year, you give the land a rest and that human beings are the same, that we're not meant, we're not the energizer bunny. We're not meant to function and function and produce and produce and produce. And that it's very countercultural, but letting people have rhythms of work and rest actually means that they will be more productive when they emerge, if you have to go to that place. And a lot of businesses, secular businesses now are um, embracing this awareness that that when people have sane rhythms of work and rest, they're actually more productive um, because they can bring better energy and better attention to what it is that they're supposed to be about. Um, Isn't it amazing how the yeah. truth of God's word applies <laughs> in mm -hmm. all contexts? Yeah. Our culture is yeah. just finally catching up with what has been, yeah, truth this whole time. Yeah. I And I do think that... Um, it, it, it may be worthy of even a biblical and theological conversation, which is why I did the theological work in this book, um, because Sabbath is a gift, and there's no question it was given. It's part of God's very nature. God practiced Sabbath, um, not because God needs rest, but because ceasing is a good thing. So God ceased his work on the seventh day. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, the idea is that God created rest and peace and tranquility on the seventh day, that it's not a day of emptiness. It's actually a day where something that God created already exists, and we can enter into it if we choose. I think that's fantastic. Um, to think that there's been something created for me that I can walk into and find ways to participate in. Um, but, you know, it begins with God. Then when God called a people to himself, God gave them the gift of Sabbath, and it was a gift to them because it was a sign, symbol, and the lived reality of their freedom and their liberation from oppression. Then he did make it one of the Ten Commandments. You know, it is the fourth commandment. And I think even raising the question, how have we as Christians gotten away with believing that one of the Ten Commandments got kicked to the curb? I don't know how we do that theologically. I haven't seen any evidence that God removed the Fourth Commandment, so we might need to grapple at that level. Um, and then people might say, well, Jesus didn't teach about it. You know, it's just a Jewish thing. And I want to say, no, he didn't teach about it because he was practicing it. It was just assumed. He was a practicing Jew. He and his disciples practiced the Sabbath. That's clear to us in the New Testament. But Jesus did reframe the Sabbath to sort of rescue it from the legalism that it had fallen into within the Jewish tradition, you know. Um, and he said very, very clearly, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man or humankind. So he, he, I mean, he's saying it was, we, you know, it was made for us. He's not taking it back. Um, and then, of course, you know, all the way through the book of Hebrews, where Hebrews 4 talks about the fact that the rest of God is still available to us as God's children, and that when we refuse God's rest, we are rebellious children. We are being disobedient. So I don't know. You might want to wait to pull out those big guns, but if you have to, there they are. <laughs> Ruth has you ready. There you go. Yeah, she does right there. <laughs> no, I keep I'm... that in your back pocket unless you need it. <laughs> yeah, what pages is that on the book? <laughs> um, no, I'm glad actually, Ruth, that you went there too. And again, mm -hmm. just talking about the importance of the board, that is a critical piece that we see. And as mm -hmm. you know, at ECFA, we have our governance standards, and I just mm -hmm. think in this area of providing a level of care for the leader and even the leader's yeah. integrity. We talked about the humanness of leaders and uh, it would be foolish for us to expect that leaders can handle this all on their own or do it all yeah. on their own. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'd love for you to speak even to boards uh, of organizations and encourage them, you know, um, in terms of being open-minded about providing yeah. a level of care and support uh, whether the leader is asking you for it or not. Yes, it would be preferred if they didn't have to ask for it, you know, 
it would be preferred if that was just part of the culture when a leader comes into the culture. Now, you know, if it's not there, it may be the job of a particular leader in that season to lead out on that topic. But then eventually, hopefully, it becomes part of the cultural norm. And then anybody who comes in walks into this norm that the organization is actually holding all the time. Um, and that is pretty exciting when we get some of these cultural no these norms established as part of the culture. And then people know what they're getting into when they come to the organization and um, they also have it when they come versus having to implement it and ask for it, which can be awkward and difficult, you know? Oh, absolutely. You're, you know, you can be afraid people are going to think you're slacking off or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And we've seen that all across the different spectrum, you know, from the organizations that we work with. And we did a, a leader care survey not long ago and we found mm -hmm. that it was just 15%, I think, of organizations said that they're, mm -hmm. um, that their boards had anything really proactive in place to provide a level of care mm -hmm. for the leader. And yeah, Ruth, if you had seen some of the open-ended comments on the survey, I'm sure oh, that it just grabbed wow. your heart. But so many yeah. of these leaders feeling isolated or feeling like they can't bring up that conversation or that's awkward with the board. Mm -hmm. And so I think that dynamic is, is definitely out there. Well, um, I know too, we talked a little bit about Sabbath, Ruth, you were talking about sabbatical as well. And I know that's even in some ways kind of how you've broken up this latest book of yours. Um, but a question about sabbatical too, and, and that would be, I know there's probably many leaders who have some level of an underlying sense that maybe this is something that I need. They're waking up to that realization. What is the first step? What is the first step that a leader should consider taking um, mm -hmm. when they're sensing this need for Maybe I'm even doing the Sabbath thing well. Um, mm -hmm. What would be that first step towards um, looking at a sabbatical? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, um, you know, I came into an awareness that I had been practicing Sabbath for 20 years, and I was still I was coming into Mondays not ready to be back to work, mm -hmm. and that Sabbath was not enough. That my levels of exhaustion were deeper than what a 24-hour Sabbath could actually touch and solve, and so that's when I asked for my per first sabbatical. And at that time, it was not embedded in our own organization, you know, because I've been the only CEO here, um, and I'd never asked for it, and no one on the board ever brought it up, and so you know, it just didn't get you know, just didn't get implemented. But wow, when I did bring it up, our board just met me right there awesome. and wanted it so badly <laughs> for me. So we, um, we, we, you know, developed a statement of intention and a, and a policy right then. And, um, they granted it to me immediately. And, um, you know, I, I developed a simple proposal and I was very, very grateful that they didn't ask for some big, huge fat rationale and documents and <laughs> pages and pages. I mean, as tired as I was, that would have just killed me. More but work I just to wrote go on your sabbatical. Heart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I did. I wrote from yeah. my heart what I was needing and what I was desiring, and they affirmed it, and then they raised the money for it. And I want to mention that because if we don't provide the funds for the sabbatical, a lot of what needs to happen on the sabbatical can't happen. Right. It's just another weight and another burden for that leader to have to raise the money. Um, and so it was so generous, and I felt so loved by it, um, both by my board and by my staff. The board, because they provided it, the staff, because they stepped up and said, we'll take care of things while you're gone. Yes. And really sacrificed to do it. So it's a communal thing. Sabbatical is a communal thing. So the first thing might be that you have to really get honest about the fact that you're not doing very well. You know, totally it's hard. Um, and I hope you have a board that you can trust, people who are listening. I hope you have a group of people that, that you know care for you because that's what I got met with was just utter deep care um, in a very vulnerable moment for me. Um, and, um, you know, express what you feel that you need. Um, I'm, I hope there is not a need for rationale for a sabbatical, but the rationale is in the book if you need it, um, where I actually talk about the history of it and the fact that um, it, you know, has, that that language has been sort of co-opted by the academic community because now they see it as time for writing books and doing research and all the things you can't do while you're teaching, but that's just not right More from work. a biblical standpoint. <laughs> More work, and it's and it just feeds into our performance-oriented, achievement-oriented drivenness when what the person really needs is rest. And so, there the rationale for sabbatical is in there, is in the book, and you can Good. use that and discuss it. Um, I don't need to go into all of that right now. Your first step, if it's you, 
is to acknowledge that you're not doing well and this is what you need um, and to, to present that need to the board and trust that they care for you. Um, and I just pray that nobody ever gets kicked when, they're, when they come in asking for, for what they need at this level. Um, and then there'll be a planning period, you know, where you'll, you know, you will propose something. Uh, you will make plans, you know, because plans help you to live into your intentions. There, um, if there are not funds set aside, you can fundraise for it, which is what our board did, because we didn't have the funds because we didn't have a sabbatical policy yet. I really like to see sabbatical already in the employment agreement for mm. the leader um, because and, and that the timing of it is known even as you come in it's a part of what you agree to when you come so that everybody knows it from the outset that there's going to be a sabbatical out there at this predetermined time so that you're planning for it all the way along that's ideal if you can get to a point yes. you know where that's where that's true um, so you know, you'll need to identify the right season for you and for your organization. I did try to get a sabbatical a year before the one that I actually got. And um, we were, you know, in a place where we were having some financial difficulties, so I couldn't step away. But also, um, my dad was failing, and I was the one closest to care for him. Mm-hmm. And, and my, my older brother, who helped me, was going on his sabbatical he's a pastor and he said Ruth I don't think we can both go at the same time and so I waited but I was pretty toasty by the time I got to <laughs> my sabbatical having waited a year longer than I should have you know yeah. that, knowing that I needed it earlier but our board and our staff were even really good about that and we found ways to go easy on me during that year and to give me a longer retreat so I got a longer retreat that year just to help me make it you know until my sabbatical time so um, and then, you know, you have to make plans with your staff. You have to really get clear about who's going to ca- cover the different responsibilities. Uh, you know, I, we mapped it out. If, you know, if it's this, you go to this person. If it's this kind of an issue, you go to that person. Uh, you know, chain of command and all of that needs to be clear. Um, even to be clear about what, if there is anything at all that would interrupt the, the person's sabbatical, go ahead and identify that so people really know what they can interrupt you for and what they really should not interrupt you for. And that'll put um, you at ease. Yeah. Absolutely. If I know that, say, for instance, um, one of my employees goes through is going through a life-threatening, life-altering emergency, I don't want to be absent from that. And I'm going to put that in the category of your neighbor's cow falling into the ditch and helping your neighbor get the cow out of the ditch. You know, there is a category like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) So you want to make those plans and be clear so people can be confident. So and I also encourage people to think carefully about, um, you know, your entry into sabbatical and really planning well for that and having even a ritual of sending if possible and I actually include an example of that in the book that my staff gave to me when I left a little service that they prepared and then um, you want to make really wise plans for re-entry as well um, because re-entry can be really traumatic if you haven't um, planned for it to be gradual and good for your soul you know it's sort of like you know here in our Chicago winters where um you have to ease into winter so that your blood can thicken. <laughs> you know, um, you know if you if you yeah. dump people back in the deep end of the pool without any transition, it could be really really difficult, and it could make for a bad couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, Ruth, this has been such a rich discussion. Uh, I'll give you the opportunity. Any any final comments? Anything else that's sort of on your heart to share as you think mm. about this topic for the ECFA community? Yeah, thank you. Um, Well, in the epilogue, the epilogue is called Saved by Rest. And it talks about the fact that in Jewish writings, the Jewish people would say that they did not keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath kept them. And I have, I really feel that in my life, that the Sabbath has kept me, that I'm still alive because of the Sabbath. I'm still actively involved in ministry because of the Sabbath. and, you know, Isaiah 30 says, in, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence, which is the tone of Sabbath, in, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And so Isaiah 30, actually, the whole context there walks through the fact that the Israelites had the offer of rest from God, but they refused it. And it moves through some of the excuses that they made and some of the ways in which they resisted Sabbath. It's a very challenging chapter, actually, in Scripture. And um, so I work through those in the epilogue, you know, to finally get us to the place of saying, why? 
Why am I not willing? Why am I still resisting? Why am I rebelling when God is offering, out, offering me this great gift? And even to get to that question would be really, really helpful and fruitful, I think. Um, if you find yourself resisting, be curious about your resistance. Why am I resisting? What am I resisting? Why is this so hard? And just see what happens. And um, God could, you know, really work, you know, in your willingness to be with that question, because I believe that the Sabbath will save our lives. Yeah. Wow. Well, we could go on, but what a perfect place mm-hmm. to end in God's word. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good word. Yeah. May the Sabbath uh, keep us, continue to keep us mm-hmm. as leaders and coming full circle where this conversation mm-hmm. began to. And we talked about some of those that have fallen or catastrophic situations or whatever mm-hmm. it may be. That is not the heart of God. Mm-hmm. So thank God for the Sabbath uh, mm-hmm. and that it can keep us. Ruth, thank you so mm-hmm. much. Thank you for your work. Uh, Mm -hmm. all that you're doing through the Transforming Center, and in particular, too, this new book, uh, Embracing Healthy Rhythms of Rest and Work. We appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Good to be with you, Mike. We can't thank you enough for listening to ECFA's Behind the Seal podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. We're planning on releasing two a month in 2023. And share this with a friend a coworker, a ministry partner, a board member. The more conversations we're having about leadership integrity and healthy leadership and the soul of the leader, the better. And don't forget, this is all compiled at ecfa.org slash podcast. That's ecfa.org slash podcast.